I have the pleasure of inviting Nancy Lublin, the founder and CEO of Crisis Text Line, to join us, and Eric Gunderson, the founder and CEO of Mapbox, to join us. And Nancy already did the mic drop. She did the mic drop before even getting on stage. This time I'm going to sit in the middle. I'm, yeah, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, are you on? Um, yep. Yep, you're on. Um, hey, man. So, hey. So both of your projects, I mean, you have pretty different projects that I want you to talk about, but they both depend on engaged communities that you probably wouldn't engage with without these little mobile things in our pockets. So maybe I'll start with you, Nancy, and maybe you guys can, I, I'm going to try to stay out of it so you guys can bounce off each other, because you guys are such shrinking violence, the two of you. Um, but Nancy, how dependent are you, and how did you build this community that, that allows Crisis Text Line to be what it is? Um, the community was the biggest surprise. Here, I'm going to slide this way because I can't see a lot of people. The community was the biggest surprise of this. When we first built this, we really thought about the texters as our audience. And we thought, I mean, we always thought that they would glob onto this because it's common usage. It's text. They know how to text. And um, that's the primary way people communicate. Um, what we didn't expect was this community of crisis counselors to be as vibrant as it is. So when we first launched, we thought we would be the pipes. And we put out an RFP to crisis centers uh, to actually do the counseling. You guys should come in and sit down. It's OK. <laughs> oh, OK. Or shrink. That's fine. OK. <laughs> Um, anyway, so... Uh, That's Jackie. You're going to meet her tomorrow. Okay, Jackie's hi. Okay, cool. Hi. So, uh, <laughs> and so we launched with three crisis centers, and then our volume went bananas, and we quickly had six crisis centers, and then 11, and we said, well, they're all really disparate. They're saying different things. So we tested like a magic 12th cohort where we scraped best practices, and we trained our own crisis counselors, and very quickly saw that they outperformed on every KPI. They were faster. They had higher quality ratings. And they were volunteers. We weren't paying them, and we were paying these other crisis centers. So we said, well, let's do that. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> So in 2015, we pushed those crisis centers off, and we pivoted completely to our own crisis counselors who we trained. Is anybody here a crisis counselor? Hi. Hi. Yeah, hi, Sam. Thank you. Yeah. So we have, um, in, the last, uh, in just the last 28 days, we have almost 3,800 Sams. And um, so it's, and it's this really vibrant community. People travel around the country to meet each other, and it's incredibly diverse. There's, about three dozen active duty military personnel. There's about three dozen deaf crisis counselors. It's, um, there's a lot who are rural. We have a handful in Dubai. It's really, it's pretty awesome. And Eric, you also are an incredibly successful young startup that also works with an engaged community of folks. Can you tell a little bit of that story? And like, could, would you exist without the community that, that, you, that supports you? No. So, uh, I started uh, I, st I started Mapbox with a with a group of um, with a with a group of developers uh, that grew out of a project called Development Team. We're literally on the ground uh, working with the UN, working with the World Bank, trying to help people tell stories with with data. But y you're you're working in these austere environments. There's no there, there there's no map to tell that story on, and so much of data is 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 geo. Well, the reason there wasn't any map in a lot of these places was because the people in those places couldn't make the map themselves, right? I mean, mapping used to be, is just has historically been a very uh, capital intensive uh, process. So, you know, going back to 2007, you, you have this moment when digital maps weren't new, right? We, we had these online. But in 2007, when the iPhone came out, the map started being drawn right around a blue dot. And this is a moment where the map starts forming around you. But the problem was there wasn't any data f to power that map yet. But there was this growing community. It was about, I want to say, five or six years old, called OpenStreetMap. And you know, similar qualities to, to Wikipedia, where you could start going in and, and, and adding your house, adding a road, adding context about a neighborhood that's in, uh, that, that you live in or, or where you grew up. This is an incredibly profound moment where you know, every, this is, everybody's looking back on this being like, wow, this is 
you know, th th this has been proven now. But when you and I first met, the idea of crowdsource data from a uh, local community seemed crazy to many folks. And you, you start having this nexus of... It seemed a little crazy to me, too, to be honest, but you talked me into it, so we, it made sense. <laughs> and we, we should, we, and I, I hope a little later in the conversation we talk about you know, how communities work with technology and how do you fund it from a sustainability standpoint. You know, Jen was talking about some of the open data pieces and, uh, and where the open source component comes in. I mean, the, the reality is to, to continue to nurture community, it's, it's just like any kind of diet. You, you, you need a lot of support from, uh, from different diverse aspects. And uh, so yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been an amazing couple, uh, couple years. We're a combination of a really rich community and uh, key investments from new satellite imagery to better sensors on the phone, all starts creating this amazing feedback loop. And the best thing of all is, you know, now in, pl in places all around the world, there's, there's a map to help us make better decisions about, about where we live. I think, that's, I think that's incredibly profound. And you guys help fund that. So what, what's this year been like for you guys? I mean, I think for a lot of us, as I said in the opening, it, the last year has been a moment of yeah. reflecting on what did we get wrong? Were we overly optimistic? I mean, you guys both, I mean, Nancy, you work with like, the most critical context people can be in in the course of their day, lot, daily lives. How has this year been different or similar from the last five, the first five years of CTO? Um, this year's been very busy. So I'm in the pain business, and there's a lot of people in pain. Um, I would count this year for us as kicking off on election night. So on election night at one point, were you on on that night, Sam? Were you on the platform? No, okay. One point in time that night, we were saying eight times normal volume around 9, 10 p.m. It was, it was ridiculous. And there was three groups of people, um, LGBTQ texters, and the number one word they used was scared. Um, uh, immigrants and children of immigrants who were worried about being deported. And the third group was uh, sexual assault survivors. I personally took a conversation with someone who had been raped that day who said, should I bother going to the police? Um, who's going to believe me when we just elected a pussy grabber? Um, uh, so that was the beginning of a long year. Also things like uh, you had major suicides in the last year, Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park, um, uh, who's a real icon for like a, uh, your music journalist, for a particular age group of feelers. And then, um, I don't know if any of you watched 13 Reasons Why, or know about it, or have a kid who watched it. Uh, that was brutal. So um, I'm really fun at cocktail parties right now. <laughs> and, um, uh, what, one good thing, though, is sad liberals are great volunteers. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, <laughs> we have seen. We have, fortunately, because essentially we're a marketplace, much like Kickstarter, um, we're hiring if you're looking. So um, uh, <laughs> um, we're, like, we're a marketplace, so I don't control supply and I don't control demand. And so demand has clearly been bonkers in the last year. But supply, starting with the election, has also gone up. We've had tons of sad liberals who in addition to funding resistance things and thinking about running for office are also like, I want to volunteer and I want to do something that matters. And so our volunteer numbers have also gone up and especially went up in that first part of the year. So um, it's been a very interesting year. I'll, I'll leave it with, it took us four years to the first 50 million messages back and forth. It's going to take 10 months to do the second 50 million. Before I go to Eric for your 2017 report, um, I'll, I'm still looking for questions, so at news challenge, hashtag news challenge if you have questions. Sorry, I didn't mention that earlier. Um, look, uh, aside from the personal pain uh, over... 741, uh, 741 if you need <laughs> it. <laughs> I mean, there, uh, there, there, have been, there have been some amazing times. And, you know, one of the, one of the things I was, uh, you know, not, not expecting uh, on this is, uh, you know, how do you help add, add context, right? I mean, when I... When I was getting development seeds started, you know, the, you know, I was, I was, uh, the person I was starting with, Ian, Ian Ward, we, we met literally protesting uh, in front of Dick Cheney's house during, during the war, right? And so you, you grow up and you're just like, well, I, I've, I've seen shit, you know? And they, now you have this incredibly idealistic uh, group of people uh, that, that you get to work with every day that, that actually grew up under one of the most amazing presidents we've ever had in our history. <coughs> And 
I don't know. I just, I, I never thought I'd, it's been an interesting moment of feeling a little old. I mean, I appreciate you calling me young here. But like to actually try to add context. I said you have a young to, startup. To, thank you. Yeah, well, <laughs> startup. To, to, um, to actually add context. Well said, well said. Uh, to, to, to folks, to help focus on what, what is so exciting. And you know, for me, what's been so exciting this year, you've seen mainstream adoption of open data and open source at a level that's just just exquisite. And I, I think what you know, some of what we're seeing on the open uh, on, on the open data side is going to be the key ingredient for a lot of machine learning and uh, and artificial intelligence. And now to look look back at the at a project that I started years ago, be be in even better hands. Uh, with Ian Schuler and what you know, what Development Seed is doing, and you know, you have new open data and new satellites coming out from NASA and how they're starting to process to be able to have better estimates of uh, hurricane strengths. You know, it's just it's like there, there's this amazing moment where what we've been building for the last couple of years is starting to hit a curve like this. Um, now, the downside of hitting a curve like this, I, I think, was brought up in regards to just some of the inherent consolidation that starts happening, right? Because whoever has access, I mean, the way deep learning works is it learns from something, right? So whoever has access to that learning corpus is going to very quickly start accelerating. And you know, I think we're at this moment now where some of the open data work that's been invested for years and years and years is starting to become a really powerful corpus for all of us to benefit from a level of machine learning that, uh, that, that can really help, uh, uh, help us out. Do you want, are you optimistic about machine learning? How are you guys incorporating it into your work? I'm optimistic about how we're going to use it. You know, we're going to use it to be faster and more accurate. That's what we're doing now. Um, I'm creeped out by some of the companies who call us and want to train on our data corpus. Right. So our corpus is really valuable. It's tagged by humans on both sides. It's an unstructured data corpus. It's all sentiment. Like I don't fault them, but um, there are some creepy ass companies out there. <laughs> that you're all using every day. <laughs> <laughs> that call and say things like, uh, can we train on your set? Well, if you don't give it to us, we can get it other ways. <laughs> Which is like putting me on notice. Um, would you like, I'll bet you're interested in outcome data, Nancy. Like, what happens to your textures afterwards? And I'm like, that would be nice to know. Like we, um, and they're like, well, we can give it to you, because we can scrape it and tell you the last time they logged in with us and if they're still alive. Just give us all your mobile numbers. Kidding me? Yeah. No, this is, it's, it, is, it, is, uh, it is increasingly terrifying what is possible uh, with random pieces of data. And you know, we, we have this notion of you know, PII. It's like you know, most of that's like a social security number or something. Uh, the more scary data is the stuff that's not PII, right? I mean, being in the, being in the location business, if you do not design your systems uh, from an anonymized data collection standpoint from the start, mm -hmm. things get freaky, right? Uh, so I, I do, I, you know, we are really trying to share best practices with other developers because anybody building an app that has anything to do with location starts becoming that kind of vector. Yep. And if you don't talk about best practices of anonymizing data, uh, a certain kind of encryp encryption technology, and you know, we're spending a lot of time talking about that in context of AWS because that's accessible. Yep. Uh, if you don't start sharing these best practices, you, you really open up a lot of different vectors of different apps. So I'm, it's so layered also, because it's true. So we've got the mobile carriers have agreed to dump everything and to pull us from billing statements. But we're on AWS. We use Twilio. And there's so many other things. There's so many other ways to get at our stuff. Well, you're welcome. And, um, uh, and then there's not common rule sets, like how long should you hold on to things? Mm -hmm. um, and how should automated scrubbing work? And I mean, there's just, there aren't set practices. I'm, I am also on the board of change.org. Mm -hmm. Change.org has an enormous data set that's very interesting, especially when you consider the amount of work that change.org does in like Russia and the Russian activists who have really relied on change.org. And um, I mean, lives are at stake. If someone were to get a hold of the names of the Russian activists who have uploaded some of these petitions, it's very sketchy, and yet there aren't common rule sets on encryption. I was really hoping that DJ was going to be able to get this done um, when he was in the White House. The yeah, that DJ Patel was going to be able to get this done um, during the Obama administration and issue a paper on here are best practices on privacy and security. I know there are a lot of people in the room who are working on this. We need like a Hippocratic oath. Um, we need some common set of standards for what it means to carry a blue lightsaber in this space.
you're teeing up some of the later conversations oh, sorry. really well. So good coordination. No. So um, Nancy, one question that came in from Twitter from Aaron is how do you have any sense of how participating as a counselor has changed the counselors, or and or can you like how does it change you? I'm, I'm I, I have a 12 year old daughter. Um, and so she looks at me all the time and is like, Mom, your crisis text lining me again. Um, so, it's definitely, so it's definitely changed like, the way that I talk. Here's a couple of like, tidbits. Um, you never want to use a why question. So questions that start with the word why, are just, they're useless. You won't get good information out of people. It sounds condescending. It's negative. Better questions start with how or when. Um, the best words you can use are smart, proud, and brave if you want to make somebody else feel strong. There's sentence structures, all that kind of stuff. And so I was talking to Wendy Kopp about this. Teach for America, when it first started, thought that it was all about student outcomes. And what they've realized along the way is that actually the core members, something like 70% of them stay in education after their two years of service. And so they've done all these studies on what's the impact on having these tens of thousands of core members out there in the world caring about public education. So um, we talked to their evaluators, and we're, we're probably going to hire them or other evaluators to look at what's the impact of our crisis counselors. We've now trained 10,000 people in these Jedi skills, hmm, second Star Wars reference, in these uh, Jedi skills of empathy and cultural competency and um, having hard conversations who are now like out there on military bases and in churches and cul-de-sacs. And you know, they're real life people on two legs. And um, what are, what's the impact? I don't know yet. So I, I want to touch on what, and I don't know how much you're thinking about this, Nancy, but Eric, I know you're spending a lot of time outside of the US. What are you, as you think about the next 10 years, what are you learning from what you're doing in China? What are you learning about from India? What are you learning from Southeast Asia? And what is going to, in terms of, you know, Knight Foundation works and thinks locally about communities here in the United States, what should we be anticipating based on what you're learning, what's emerging? Yeah, one of the, one of the de depressing anecdotes from uh, the panel right before was talking about, uh, you know, as, as newspapers have come under increasing pressure, international reporting budgets have been, been cut. Uh, I'm in China almost every two months right now. I don't, it is, you know, th th there is a notion here in America that things are done fast, things are done cheap. That, you know, I, I'm going for a run in Shanghai. The sidewalks are perfect. The, the quality of transportation there, their bike share system uh, in regards to dockless bikes is beyond last mile. Their, their payment system uh, in, uh, in regards to mobile pay has created an entire banking se uh, sector for an unbank. It's just like, you know, the innovation is going to start getting imported. And I don't think America knows that. And that freaks me out. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I don't know, I, like, how, how do you how do you share what you what you've seen over there? You know, bit by bit, there's just like there's a level of of quality, and honestly, um, it just there, there's a lot of aggressiveness outside the U.S. and people putting their heads down, and honestly, getting uh, getting radically more skilled and teched up than we are, and uh, I think it's going to be a very very interesting next uh, next next couple years. Uh, I mean, we're you know in school we're we're taught we're as Americans we're taught we're special, and I, I think that's going to be a very interesting moment when there are some there are some cultures that are going to be proven to be more creative, uh, more ahead, more advanced, getting more stuff done than than we are. That's going to be an interesting point of uh, mm -hmm. passing the torch. Nancy, where do you look for inspiration? I mean, like you're a serial entrepreneur, you start a new thing every couple of years. Like, how do you? How do you decide what's next? Um, I like solving problems. And I never know what they're going to be. I mean, Crisis Text Line grew from the rib of dosomething.org. Aria is here. And uh, I didn't think I was going to be in this space, but it was compelling. And, and somebody had to do it. And so I did it. And uh, we're not done. I really think we should help a billion people. Um, I think this is a global issue. And so we're going to expand to 20 countries in the next four years. Um, we're already training people in Canada and the UK. And I'd like to bring this to other parts of the country where no mental health services exist and when there's no data. Because um, if we can create a global map, like if you go to crisistrends.org, you can see what we've aggregated and anonymized for the US. It's pretty cool. But um, imagine doing that for the world. 
And um, this is where the technology getting ahead of policy is exciting because um, there is no unified, or in some places there's no definition of domestic violence. If you're married, do whatever you want. Um, there is no definition or common definition of what is a minor. And so if the technology, because we are working in fields and in systems, Jen Palka, because we do work in systems like this, if we establish that and a universal definition of these things, we can then have a global map of mental health and, that, and behavioral health, and that'll be really exciting. It can change a lot of things. So I'm, I'm bullish on the next four years. Having said that, I'm, I, am, I do have a side hustle already that I'm working on. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I've got a side hustle I'm working on the side, too. Yeah, tell us. Can we all, by the way, I don't know how much more you're going to be up here, but tomorrow's your last day. This is crazy. Who's going to return our phone calls? The night <laughs> nobody, because nobody else there returns phone calls. You're oh. great. And we're... <laughs> Hold on, am I alone? Come on, <laughs> has it not been? No, you know what I'm talking about. So what I was gonna ask right. Nancy well, I miss you. was, was as, as veteran successful startup CEOs, what are your, you both have built amazing teams. Um, in the minute we have left, what's, what are your CEO hacks? Startup CEO hacks. The, we have lots of, we have lots of uh, more junior Sorry, emergent executive directors here in the room. Uh, sleep training. Just start, <laughs> start early. Um, that's it. That's, that's, that's it. That's it. I, yeah, I remember. I, I re literally remember the moment I was like reading this thing. I was like, wow, Bill Clinton sleeps four hours a night. Yeah. Now, Do you have kids? Yeah, now. And it right? turns out, Makes by the way, better. 2 plus 2 plus 1 does not equal 5. <laughs> like, apparently, you can optimize to a point where it just becomes pretty, pretty brutal. But uh, no, so, because the reality is, if you, want to do, if you want to do something and lead a team, in the end of the day, it's your job to pick up the pieces. And you've got to find the time to do that. Like it's, you've, you've got to be the one that takes care of the stuff nobody else wants to do and take care of the people when they, when they fall down. That's your job. And uh, it, 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 it's just a level of work you put in. There are all the typical things like hire people smarter than you, uh, sleep is optional, the one touch rule when you open it, finish it. But I would say the best thing that I learned is, um, was taught to me by one of our supervisors. I, I, I will confess, I was afraid to be on the crisis text line platform for like the first 18 months, almost two years. I just didn't think I would be good at it. And I was afraid that I would be too emotional. Like, I cry at the Olympics when any skater falls down. Like, I just, there have been McDonald's commercials that have done it to me. I mean, like, I just, I thought I was going to be, it was going to be hard. And we had a big spike. And one of the supervisors slacked me and was like, you need to be on the platform. The community needs to see you here. And I went on, and I basically haven't left. Mm. And I'm now in the top 10 crisis counselors, just as a volunteer, <laughs> for taking conversations. And I'm in there all the time. And it's made me a better CEO. It's made me a better mom. It's made me, I hope, a better friend. I don't know, Aria can tell you. But, um, and I will never not eat the dog food. Like, okay. as a CEO, you have to be one of your top users. And you have to be in there. Um, you have to eat your own dog food. All right, well, with dog food, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to have the amazing Susan Crawford uh, talking about the subway experience and the future. We'll be back in, in 10 minutes. So people on the internet, come back and find us in about 10 minutes. Thank you, you two. Thank you. Thank you.